Thank you, Pastor Nick, for those songs. If you would turn your Bible to Hebrews chapter 3. Tonight we're continuing our series on the book of Hebrews, and we've come to chapter 3. And my subject tonight, the heavenly calling. The warnings given in chapter 2 and other places in Hebrews, they speak to us of the real dangers that face believers. We are believers. This book was written to believers, basically to the Jewish believers, where Judaizers had come in, they were trying to get them to go back to the old rituals and old ceremonial laws. And the writer of Hebrews, he tells them how much better what they have in Christ is. The heavenly calling that I'm going to talk about tonight, it's a heavenly calling and not an earthly calling. The earthly calling had been rejected by the nation of Israel. They had missed the blessing of entering the promised land. The heavenly calling, however, it is open both to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And we are admonished to be faithful to our heavenly calling so that we may reach the finish line. That's what it's all about. It's about not just beginning a race. It's about enduring until the end, finishing the race, obtaining the prize, and making heaven our eternal home. We're going to start reading in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Wherefore... Holy brethren, he's talking to the church. Partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted more worthy of more glory than Moses, talking about Jesus, inasmuch as he who has built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that buildeth all things is God. And Moses was very faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ, a son over his own home, whose house we are, look at this, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end. So he said, you got to last, you got to endure, you got to hold on to this thing firm unto the end. He's going to talk about entering the rest, but you cannot enter the rest unless you complete the course. Hebrews 3 and 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, today if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation or in the rebellion in the days of temptation in the wilderness. Talking about Israel. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their hearts. Look at that. They err in their hearts. And they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. But we are made partakers of Christ, and look at this. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Twice he's saying endure to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them? That is sin, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness. And to whom swear he they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. My subject, the heavenly calling, let us pray. Father, thank you for the living, powerful, breathing, penetrating word of God. Holy Ghost, I pray that you will anoint me to teach the word tonight. I pray that you will give us an ear to hear, that we will rightly divide it. And, Lord, that we will see a more complete work of Calvary and who we are in you as we go deep into the Word of God, line upon line, precept upon precept, looking at what the writer of Hebrews was telling us about you. Open our eyes, Lord. Give us an ear to hear. And everyone said in Jesus' name, amen. Let's look back again at Hebrews 3 and 1. 
1 through 4. It says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So there we see that Jesus is called an apostle, and he's our high priest. An apostle is one that is sent. He's sent with a message. He's sent to do something. So consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch that he who built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built it all things is God. The writer begins chapter 3 by referring to Christians as holy brethren and partakers of the heavenly calling. The only way we could be a partaker of the heavenly calling is to be a partaker of the divine nature that's in Christ through the new birth. Then, after doing this, he immediately focuses on Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our profession. That word profession there, it is better translated as our confession. Like we believe in our heart that Christ died, and then we confess with our mouth that we believe he took our sins, and he was our sin bearer, and we receive him. And with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So that word is better translated confession. Jesus is the apostle who was sent from God as the messenger of the new covenant. He spoke better things than the prophets, better things than Moses, better than what the angels said. He was sent from God to show us God, and he was so much God, he said in one place, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. As our high priest, he is able to understand all our need because Jesus is perfect man. John said, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So he is perfect man. As a man, he is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And as perfect God, he is able to meet all our need. All these mysteries were locked up in God. And the Bible says if the devil had known this, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The Lord Jesus Christ is the God-man. And can you imagine sitting on that throne that Pastor Nick was singing about and then humbling yourself, coming to this earth, I mean, you're God on the throne, coming to this earth as a baby in a manger, living your life up, out, and then going to an old rugged cross as the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Christ knew his mission. He knew his destiny. He knew that the cross was ever before him. But the Lord Jesus Christ, he is greater than any human leader. He is the Son of God. He is the heir of all things. He is a man, yet he is God. He is the creator of all things. He cried from the cross, it is finished. He cleanses us from all sin. He redeemed us with his own precious blood. He rose from the dead. He ascended to the highest point in the universe. He sat down at the right hand of his heavenly Father. He is Lord of a new and a better covenant. He has all authority. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the head of his body, the church. You ought to be on your knees, shout, on your feet shouting by now. Amen. The Lord Jesus is greater than the angels. Angels worship him because he is the eternal God. His throne is forever. He is the ruler of the coming age. The Lord Jesus Christ is greater than Moses. Moses was a faithful servant. Christ is the Son of God over his own house. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Go on and praise him. Amen. The writer of Hebrews says, consider Jesus. The problem is we have looked at ourselves and we look at our weakness. We look at our failures. We, we look at I'm not good enough and and I deal with people like that all the time. I have failed, and, and I'm just not 
good enough as a Christian. You can't make yourself good enough. Jesus has perfected forever those that are sanctified. Jesus paid the price. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. What I could not do, he did for me. What you could not do, he did for you. Amen. And we are told to consider him. The problem is we look at ourselves and we consider ourselves. But we are told to consider him and to set our affections upon him. The Paul, Paul said in one place, he said, If you then be risen with Christ, set your affection on things above and not upon the earth. When Christ, which is our life, shall appear, we're going to disappear. Then shall we appear with him in glory. That's the blessed hope of the church. It says, looking unto Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. We're to look unto him. And he is coming for a glorious church. And he's coming after us. Why? Because we're holy brethren. We're in the body. We belong to him. And he paid for us with his own precious blood. We are told to boldly confess our confidence in Jesus because he is the apostle and high priest of our confession. He came preaching the message. He paid the price, and God highly exalted him, and when he ascended, he became the great high priest that's touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Look at Hebrews 3 and 3. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he that had built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built it all things is God. Now, Jesus, we know he created all things. By him were all things created. Without him was not anything made that was made. When God said, let that be, Jesus, the word, started working on the creation. The Holy Ghost was there, the Father was there, the Son was there, and they were working together. They worked together in that creation, and they worked together in the new creation when we become the temple of the living God. God has it all hidden inside himself. So as we have previously seen the Son, he is superior to the prophets. He is superior to the angels. And now we see that Jesus is superior to, to Moses. I mean, you know, the people, they, Jewish people, they regarded Moses as a great man. And the writer, he doesn't criticize Moses. He doesn't belittle him at all. He accepts Moses' greatness, and then he shows that as great as Moses was, Jesus is far, far greater. Hallelujah. Moses was a part of the house. But Christ is the builder of the house. Moses was a servant of the house. But Jesus is the son over his own house. Moses was the law giver. But Jesus was the life giver. That's good right there. Moses was the law giver. But Jesus was the life giver. The law was given by Moses. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Look at Hebrews 3 and 5. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, we're his temple. If we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. The house over which Moses was a faithful servant was the nation of of Israel. They're the nation that wandered in the wilderness. They're the nation that God was grieved with. They're the nation that sinned. They never did enter into God's rest. So Moses, he was faithful over his house, the nation of Israel. The house over which Jesus is the son is the church. Jesus, the son, is the head over his body, the church. So Jesus is both the builder and the head. We are his house individually, and then we are his house collectively. Think about that. Individually, we can worship him wherever we are. But then collectively, we are to assemble with people of like precious faith, and together 
we are to worship him because we are a part of a body. Whatever function you have in the body, that makes you a part of it. And the Bible's talking about the authority says that Christ has ascended. He sit down at the right hand of his majesty on high. The right hand is the hand of authority. And we are made to sit together with him in heavenly places, which means you and I, as a part of the body of Christ, we have authority. We have authority over principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness. The people, they were afraid to, to even approach God at that holy mount. They said, Moses, you go up and talk to God for us. But you and I, because of the greatness of Jesus and our great high priest, we can go boldly to the throne of grace. We can talk to the Father because we have access through the blood of Jesus. We can go behind the veil. Only the great, uh, the high priest could go behind the veil only after he had uh, made an atonement for his sin and the sin of the people could he go into the holiest of holies. But because of the power of the blood of Jesus, any time you and I want to go into the throne room of God, we can go boldly unto the throne of grace. That's how great Jesus is. That's how powerful his blood is. That's why we have access it's because of who he is, not because of who we are. The father looks at you and he looks at me and, and, and he looks over at the son and the son says, Father, they're mine. I paid for them. I bought them with my own precious blood. And, and whatever they're asking in my name, Father, I already promised them you will give it to them. Go on and praise them. Hallelujah. We have a new and a better covenant. What Israel had is nothing compared to what we have. It was a shadow. It was a type of what was coming. They were looking for Christ to come, and we're looking for him to come again. Amen? Hallelujah. Moses was a faithful servant. Verse 6 says, whose house we are. Praise God. We are the temple of the living God. And the true house, the true dwelling place of God is in his people, the church. The most high dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Heaven is his throne. Earth is his footstool. He said, hath not my hands made all things, but you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will walk in them, I will dwell in them, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's powerful. Hallelujah. Praise God. Jesus Christ is both the builder and the head. We are his house individually and collectively. Now, in the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people. But in the New Testament, God has a people for his temple. Now, think about that one. In the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people. God would meet them in the temple, the building, behind the veil, where the Shekinah glory of God would appear between the wings of the cherubims after everything was done in a proper order. But Jesus, the builder of the church and of the house, he did everything according to the proper order. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so now God has, in the New Testament, he has a people for his temple. He said, I'll dwell in you. I'm not going to dwell in these buildings anymore. God will meet us in the brush arbor. He'll meet us in a pup tent. He'll meet us at Walmart. He'll meet us in our house. He'll meet us when we come to church. He's everywhere. The psalmist said, where shall I go from thy presence? Where shall I sin? He said, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art thou. You can't go down so low and get so far away from God that his hand cannot touch you. He is the most high God. And he cares about you. And he loves you. And if you're watching by live stream tonight, and if you're way out there in sin somewhere, I want to tell you the almighty hand of God is reaching out to you tonight to touch you and transform you and change your life by the power of Calvary's blood. Hallelujah. We are God's temple. He is the head. Verse 6 said, we are God's house if we hold fast to the end. So 
There are some conditions on this thing. This admonition implies that if we don't hold fast to what we possess in Christ, then it is possible to lose it. He said, we are his house if we hold fast to the end. As believers, we are God's house. But to remain in the household of Christ, there are conditions that are laid there. And the condition is if we hold fast the confidence and rejoice of the hope from firm until the end. So it's not just starting a race. It is staying in the race. It is completing the race. We can speak boldly. We can speak confidently. Because all that Jesus, our apostle and high priest, has done, he has done it with you and with me in mind. So we have confidence. We can speak boldly. We can boldly confess his lordship and our sonship. We can boldly confess that the righteousness that he has is our righteousness. We can boldly confess that we are justified in him and we have been made just as if we had never sinned. We are redeemed. We are forgiven. We are reconciled to God. We have peace with God. We are adopted into the family. We are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. What he did on that cross, he did for his body, the church. Hallelujah. Go on and praise him. Amen. Glory to God. This book is full of rich revelation. Christ is faithful over his own house, and we are his house, and we are told to hold firm to these things unto the end. Hebrews 3 and 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, now I want you to catch that. The writer, he stops right here. He says, the Holy Ghost said this. He, he didn't say a man wrote this down, even though we know that the Holy Ghost spoke to men and they wrote down what God had said. We know that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and men wrote it down. We know holy men of old, they spoke as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. But look at what the writer says, Hebrews 3 and 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, now, this is a direct quote from Psalms 95, 7, and 11. Now, listen to it. Today, if you hear his voice, verse 8, Harden not your heart as in the provocation of the rebellion in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart. And they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Now verse 12 says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But I want to go back. I want you to notice uh, Hebrews 3 through 11. Now I want you to look, if you would pull up Psalms 95 7 through 11. Hebrews 3, 7 through 11. We just read that. Now I want us to look at Psalms 95, 7 through 11. The verses, this blew me away. The verses are identical in the Bible. I mean, Hebrews 3, 7 through 11, and Psalms 95, 7 through 11. The verses are the same. Look at this. Psalms 95, 7. For he is our God, we are his people, his passion, the sheep of, of his hand. Now, here it is, verse 7. Today, if you will hear his voice, go on to the next verse, please. Harden not your heart as in the provocation, as in the day of the temptation in the wilderness, verse 9. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works, verse 10. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation, and see it, it is a people that do error in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. Verse 11. Unto whom I swear in my wrath, they should not enter my rest. What the writer is saying is the Holy Ghost said. The Holy Ghost said they're not going to enter my rest. And then he quotes the, entire, the entirety of those verses 
in Hebrews 3. The Holy Ghost said. The writer said, because the Holy Ghost said they can't enter the rest, they can't enter. That's not just something written in a book. This is what the Holy Ghost said. The Holy Ghost said, by his stripes you are healed. The Holy Ghost said, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The Holy Ghost said, no weapon formed against you shall ever prosper. The Holy Ghost said, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. The Holy Ghost says that you and I are more than conquerors through him that loved us and gave himself for us. The Holy Ghost said that our sins were cast into a sea of forgetfulness. The Holy Ghost said there is therefore now no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. The Holy Ghost wants you to know that what's in this book is the Word of God that holy men wrote down what the Holy Ghost said. And if you have a need, all you got to do is find what this book says right here. And the Holy Ghost said, I, I had somebody, I said, you're healed by the stripes of Jesus. And they come back, they said, I, I don't feel healed. And you told me I was healed. Well, now I got a, a little more revelation. I'm going to tell them the next time the Holy Ghost said you're healed. Go on, praise him, because I found it in the book. <laughs> Hallelujah. Woo! Isn't that good? That was worth coming to church if you didn't get anything else tonight. All you got to do is go read uh, Hebrews 3 and 7, the Holy Ghost said, and, and, and go look it up, and anything you want to find in this Bible, just say the Holy Ghost said, hallelujah. God said it. He said, whatsoever things I bind on earth, abound in heaven. So I bind the devil. I counsel his assignment. I'm here on earth. I bind him in second heaven, his works. Uh, I bind sickness. I bind disease. I bind cancer. I bind the works of darkness. And I loose the power of God. I loose his promises in third heaven. The Holy Ghost said, what I bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever I loose on earth is loose in heaven. The literal translation means whatever I've already bound on earth is already bound in heaven. Whatever I've already loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. God says I've given you 5,700 and some promises. Why don't you start speaking them? Why don't you start proclaiming them? The Holy Ghost already said it. Hallelujah. Why don't you say it on earth so it can be loosed in heaven? Somebody go and praise them. Hallelujah. What the writer of Hebrews is saying is that this Jesus Christ who said, if you ask the Father anything in my name, he will give it to you. This Jesus Christ who said, anything you ask in my name, that will I do that your joy may be full. The Holy Ghost has already said, you can have it if you believe it. And if you'll confess it with your mouth, glory to God. Hallelujah. We are blessed going out. We are blessed coming in. Everything we put our hands to is blessed. Yes, there's a devil. Yes, there's an enemy. But the Holy Ghost said, you are more than conquerors. Thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Go on and praise him. Hallelujah. Woo! The Holy Ghost said. That's why I'm a word man. That's why I preach the word. Because the Lord told me a long time ago, he said, preach my word. He said, learn it, memorize it, speak it. It'll do exactly what I said it'll do. And, and what the writer of Hebrews, I believe the reason he injected that in there is so that we could get a little revelation that the greatness of God is in the person of Christ. He is the word. So what is in that book is who he is. And he's greater than the prophets. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than Moses. God highly exalted him and gave Jesus a name above every name. And every knee must bow and every tongue must confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The devil has no choice but to obey you because the Holy Ghost said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. The Holy Ghost said. Because Jesus, the Son, is greater than anyone else. God highly exalted him. 
God actually gave him his name. The angel only uh, was the messenger. The angel said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. But God gave him a name above every name. Amen. Some people say, well, you know, you just can talk and talk, and God understands. You don't have to mention the name of Jesus. No, I like to mention the name. God exalted that name. Hallelujah. God did it. The Father did it. And he gave us the use of his name. And I, I, I was here listening to someone say that, you know, about prayer. No, I'm going to pray in the name of Jesus. I'm going to talk his name. I'm going to speak his name. Because I, I read somewhere in Acts chapter 3 how Peter and John were at the gate called Beautiful. And there was a lame man there. And they said, silver and gold have I none, but such I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And immediately, well, he didn't get up immediately. So Peter reached down and grabbed him and lifted him up. The power of God hit him in the legs. He went dancing and praising God and went to church. Amen. And later on, they called him, the Sanhedrin called him and said, don't you preach anymore in that name called Jesus. How did you do this? Peter said, his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man whole whom you see and know. You know he was lame. He's been lame since he was born. But a couple of men came by, full of the Holy Ghost, spoke the name of Jesus, and he stands before you healed and whole. Go on, praise God. Hallelujah. Take heed, brethren, lest thou be in any of you, verse 12, an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. So we see that these Jewish Christians that Paul or the writer is writing to, they are being tempted to go back to their old ways. And they thought no one could be any greater than Moses. But the writer lets them know there's a name above all names. And then he gives us this warning, take heed, brethren. He's talking to the church. Least there be in any of you an evil heart of, the, of unbelief of departing from the living God. For 40 years, Israel, they had wandered in the wilderness. For 40 years, they had manna from heaven. They had water from a rock. They had clothes that did not wear out. They had a cloud by day to keep them cool and a pillar of fire by night to keep them warm. Still, they doubted, grumbled, complained, rebelled, and longed to return to Egypt. Why? We remember the, the onions and the garlic, my Lord. That's what they wanted to go back to. And God's given them angel food from heaven. Flew in some quail to satisfy them. I mean, for 40 years, God had provided for them, yet they still murmured and complained. They tempted God. And because of the hardness and the unbelieving heart, God was grieved with the entire generation. And you know the story. See, that is a process that leads to apostasy, departing from the faith and drifting away from God. That's a process. It does not start all at once. It comes over a period of time. Amen. Departing from the faith, drifting away from God. Verse 8, if you could put verse 8 up there, if you would, I'll just go real slow with it. Hebrews 3 and 8, it says, it talks about the hardening of the heart. Harden not your hearts, as in the rebellion. Verse 10 talks about the erring heart. Look at the process. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said they do always error in their hearts. So we saw a hardening heart. That's a process, watch. We see an erring heart. In verse 12, look at this, my Lord. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. See the process? The heart begins to harden. 
He's talking to Christian. He's talking to you and me. The hardening of the heart, verse 10, the erring of the heart, verse 12, the evil heart, the heart of unbelief. Departing from something means to drift away or to withdraw yourself. Notice that this warning, it is addressed to Christians. When the Bible speaks of the heart, it does not mean the physical organ that pumps the blood throughout the body. But the heart is who we are, the inner man, the hidden man of the heart. It is the seat of our affection. Where do you set your affection? Upon earthly things? carnal things? Are we pleasure seekers more than lovers of God? Or do we set our heart upon things above? Do we really appreciate what Jesus has done by giving us this great salvation? It's so great that the angels and the prophets and Moses and Abraham, they couldn't understand all of it. It was locked up in God. It was so great that if the princes of this world, the devils, had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It is so great that God, he reserved it for the dispensation of his son, paying the price and the dispensation of the Holy Ghost, so that God could reach out and gather people of every kindred, tongue, and nation into his kingdom. And if the devil had known that, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. God is so great, he had a mystery plan that the devil didn't even understand it. Hallelujah. And guess what? When God did that, God, the Father, had you and me and the whole world in his heart. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is truly a great, great salvation. Yes, devils are subject to us in the name of Jesus. But Jesus said, I don't want you to rejoice because of the gifts and the calling that you have I don't want you to rejoice because the devil is subject to you in my name. I want you to rejoice because I bought you with the price, my precious blood, and your names are written in heaven. Go on and praise him. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm telling you, this book is rich, rich, rich with revelation. There are nearly 1,000 references to the heart in the Bible. I'm going to list a few of, of them with some scripture. It says, man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh at the heart. Aren't you glad that when you are misunderstood by others, God understands you? When others don't understand why you did a certain thing, and they criticize you, and they walk off and leave you sometimes. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. I'm glad of that. I, I'm glad I have a relationship with God like that. Because as long as my heart is all right, I'm all right with God. Amen? Here's a good one. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You know that one. Jesus said, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Talking about who we are within. Look at what the Lord said in Mark 7. He says, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All of these evils come from within and defile a man. If your heart is not right with God, if my heart is not right with God, we are defiled. 
I didn't say that. The Word of God says that. Jesus said that. So it's important that we keep our hearts with all diligence because out of it come the issues of life. The heart, the seat of affection. How do I treat others? You know, sometimes I get under pressure. And uh, today I said something. I, I just, I wish I hadn't said it, but I'd already said it. But I, it's just, you know, doing, 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 and then somebody says, can you do? Well, you know, sometimes I think I've just done enough. I wish somebody else would do what they promised me they would do. And then I wouldn't have to do what I have to do. Amen. And I don't know if you ever get anything out of that, but people promise you, yeah, I'll take care of that, I'll do that, I'll do that. And then they don't ever do it. And you find it back on your plate. And when I was in the business world, it was real easy for me. I, I learned this thing real easy. I, I, I would give an assignment to people, and I'd be walking down the hall, and, and all of a sudden one of my buyers would come up and say, I did so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so, and, and says, I just could not get it done. And I started to walk off, and I realized, Jerry, that football you just handed off earlier, they just handed it back to you. So I, the first time it ever happened, I turned around, I went right back to him. I said, wait a minute, come here. I said, try this and this and this. And if that doesn't work, you come back and see me. But I believe it will work because that's exactly how I would do it. Thank you for taking care of that task for me. So now you can get away with that in the business world. But in, in King's business, shouldn't we be even more diligent to keep our promises, to do the things we have promised others we will do? I, I want to be a man of my word. I, I told a guy recently about a man that gave me his word on a handshake, and he went back on his word. And, and I don't know the guy's state as far as Christianity, but he said, man, that's bad. He's, he gave you a handshake. I said, oh, yeah, he shook my hand on it. I don't know how, what they teach kids now. Mine are grown and gone. But I taught mine, and my daddy taught me, when you give your word, it is your bond. Be a man of your word. And, and you know, we're talking about the word being a person of the word. We need to keep our word. Our word should be our bond. Amen. Blessed is the pure in heart. That's another one. For they shall see God. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And the writer of Hebrews, he warns us in Hebrews 3 and 12, he says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. See, it didn't start out as an evil heart of unbelief. You know, it, it just it didn't start that way. It began, started as a hardened heart, became an erring heart, and then it became an evil heart. <laughs> Take heed, brethren, lest thou be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Verse 13. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest ye be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now he introduces the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful. Keep that in mind. Verse 15. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, it is again, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, as in the rebellion. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all of them that came out of Israel by Moses. The people who Moses led out of Egypt, they turned a deaf ear, and they would not believe. That was their sin. They would not hear the word. They hardened their heart. They turned a deaf ear. Verse 17. But with whom was he grieved for 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So the writer, he exhorts us here to encourage one another, and then he warns us about the deceitfulness of sin. Deceitfulness, that is the characteristic element of sin. It looks beautiful. It looks wonderful. It looks so pleasurable. 
but then it turns on you and it brings destruction. It induces a person to believe that which is false is really true. And then deceit makes you think that which is true is really false. Like the devil came to Eve with his deceit. Did God really say? Yeah, God had spoken. God had said, but he deceived her. The Bible says that Eve was deceived, but the man was not deceived. Adam volitionally, willfully transgressed God's law. And that's what sin is. It is the willful transgression of God's law. You don't just fall into it. You do it by your own human will. You don't just fall into salvation. You get saved by believing and with your willpower turning to God and saying, God, deliver me from this bondage of sin. I want to serve you. Amen? So... When a person refuses to hear God's voice, that's what happened to Israel, they become prey to the deceitfulness of sin. I, I stand up here, and I preach, and I preach, and some people, they say, that doesn't apply to me. I wish so-and-so was here to hear it. No, it applies to every one of us. The Holy Ghost said, I didn't just say it. God, for some reason, had me speak it. Maybe it was for me. You know, some, some of my preaching just comes out of my overflow. Maybe it was just for somebody else. But it's for somebody because the Holy Ghost said it. And when I start preaching this word, it's living and powerful, and it brings correction. All scriptures given by inspiration of God is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good work. So it is given to help us. It's a light unto our feet a lamp unto our path we hide it in our hearts so we will not sin against God and be caught by the deceitfulness of sin sin deceives sin misleads sin destroys because sin is of the devil amen when a person refuses to hear God's voice they become prey to the deceitfulness of sin and the writer warns us today, if you hear his voice, heed his voice, while there is still opportunity. Look at Hebrews 3.14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. I want to take a close look at this verse. Look at that. We are made partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. He is talking about the cross because it is not possible to know Christ unless we know him in the realm of his sacrifice. He's saying Christ is greater than Moses. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast in the end. It must always be Jesus Christ and him crucified. The preaching of the cross is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it. We are made partakers of Christ when we are baptized into his death and when we are raised in the newness of his life. There is therefore both the divine side and the human side of our oneness with the Lord. I talked about that in chapter 2. As the captain of our salvation, he was perfected by what he suffered. So you and I could be perfected in him so he both he that sanctified and those that are sanctified they are all one and that's what the writer wants us to see he and we are one of the same father and we are both partakers of god's life and god's holiness that's why you're not under condemnation he and we are also of one humanity because the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself always took part of the same, so that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Christ became a man, so that as a man he could meet and conquer the devil, death, and the grave. Hallelujah. 
and he did it for us. He became like us so we could become like him. He was made sin without sin so we could be made the righteous of God in him. And just as truly, I want you to listen carefully, just as truly as Christ became partaker of flesh and blood, he became a man, we are partakers of Christ and his divine nature. Just as much as Jesus became like us, we become like him through the new birth. And people need to know that. That's why the writer is telling these Jewish Christians, Jesus is greater than anything you've ever known before. Hallelujah. So we become partakers of Christ, and when we do that, we enter into perfect fellowship in all that he is. All that I was, he became. And all that he is, I become. And you become. That's good. Israel, on the other hand, they wandered in the wilderness. They murmured. They tempted God with their unbelief. And God was grieved with them for 40 years, and they never entered the promised rest. That's what the writer's talking about here, entering the rest. God brought them out of Egypt to take them into Canaan. But they could not enter in because of their unbelief. So having them as an example, we are to hold fast our confidence, according to the writer of Hebrews, steadfast unto the end. Twice in this chapter, we have been told, it is not enough to begin well. We must hold fast to the end. And church, you and I, and the body of Christ, we must not permit anything to deprive us of the complete rest that is found in Jesus Christ. And that's why the Bible says, labor to enter that rest. There remaineth a rest to the children of God. And so many people in the Christian faith, they wonder year after year after year, just like the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and they never get established in Christ. They never enter into that secret place of the rest of God. And that's a wonderful place to get. And the writer of Hebrews said, labor to enter that rest. There remaineth a rest to the children of God. All that Jesus did, he did for you and me. He has made it possible for us to enter the secret place of the Most High God. Let us stand. Hallelujah. That's chapter 3. I've been changed free delivered Yes. 
presence came and changed me. No, no. presence 